Welcome. We're starting a new series for the month of October called Gracism, the Arts of Inclusion. Today, I want to begin with a story. Hussein Rashid went to Elmont Memorial High School in Long Island, New York. The community around Elmont High was rapidly changing. What once was a majority white community had rapidly become a hub for immigrants from all different cultures and backgrounds and ideologies. Can we go to the first slide? Hussein Rashid was a Muslim American student, and he was a part of the last graduating class of Elmont High to be majority white. As the culture was changing, white families, faculty, and administrators began to feel defensive and afraid about these rapid changes in their school. In high school, Hussein was outspoken in his belief that Palestinians were people and deserved equal dignity and rights. In classes and on social media, he posted concerns about the plights of Palestinians. At the same time, Hussein began being denied opportunities to participate in special programs and honors that fellow students his age and his caliber were also being permitted to participate in. The rumor had it that the superintendent of the school district didn't like Hussein's perspectives on Palestine and was actively denying him opportunities. Similarly, as senior year approached, Hussein began meeting with guidance counselors to talk about college. He and a number of other students of color were encouraged not to apply for high-level schools, being told that they would be a reach out of their reach. Despite the fact that most students of color in this particular school had higher GPAs and score higher on placement exams, when Rashid and his friends didn't, uh, did end up getting into those high-level schools, they, told, they were told that they took spots from white kids only because of the color of their skin. Rashid documented these experiences in a blog post online, and in that article, he concluded with the following words. I graduated from high school over 25 years ago. It was not the racism of a generation earlier, nor is it the racism of now. Racism adapts and grows and thrives. If we do not name it, it will live in the open, continuing to do damage to every generation. We do not outgrow it. It outlives us. We'll have to pull it up by the roots and burn it. Now, to be honest, if you're a white person sitting in this room today, hearing these stories might make you uncomfortable. Honestly, some of the subconscious thoughts I had when I first read this article was, did all of that really take place? Did that happen exactly as overtly as he said it did? Yet, if you're a person of color in the room today, you're probably just nodding along because this story sounds so familiar. Racism really is this overt. It really is this systemic. Hussein Rashid's story isn't only his story, but the story of countless people of color and other minorities in our country today. And as Rashid wrote, if we're going to deal with it, we're going to have to pull it up by the roots and burn it. We can't ignore it. We cannot bury it. We need to hear stories like Rashid's. We need to think deeply about these realities. And then we need to determine to do something about it. For the month of October, we're going to jump into this new series called Gracism, the Art of Inclusion. And this concept of gracism was developed by a mentor of mine named Dr. David Anderson in his groundbreaking book, Gracism, the Art of Inclusion. I encourage you to pick it up on Amazon if you'd like. But using scriptural insight, Dr. Anderson has outlined a Christ-centered, biblically rooted path for communities of faith just like ours to adapt and to change and to combat racism in the midst of our culture. But the book and this series isn't just about racism. We're going to look at what the scripture says as a whole about being inclusive and grace-centered and what the gospel calls us to do in relation to all the things that divide us as a culture. 
And it's my prayer that over the next four weeks, as we go through this series, that we will take time in our own life to reflect on God's call to radical inclusion. So with that said, let's dive into scripture this morning. And if you have a Bible, turn with me to Galatians 6.10. In that passage, this is what the Apostle Paul writes. When we have the opportunity to help someone, we should do it. But we should give special attention to those who are in the family of believers. In this passage, Paul calls Christians to be helpful to anybody and to everybody. He's saying that it's the duty of the Christ follower to extend love and service to everyone that we encounter. And that sounds good, doesn't it? But then he says that we're supposed to give special attention to Christians. He says, do good to everybody, but especially make sure you're helping those who are a part of your spiritual family. Now, on one hand, that statement makes sense. Of course, we should give special attention, even primary attention, to the community that we're a part of. If our own church isn't taken care of, how can we take care of anyone else? And yet, I'm sure you also probably have a sense of discomfort when you hear that, just like I do, because it doesn't sound exactly like Jesus, does it? Jesus wants to take care of everyone equally, right? And yet, here it is, written in the scriptures. So how do we match this with the example of Jesus? In scripture, Jesus talks about two concepts, favor and favoritism. Oftentimes, we hear account of God extending favor to a group of people. In our own lives, we might say that we've experienced the favor of God. People often ask us to do favors, don't they? Meaning go above and beyond what is expected to help out. And yet at the same time, the Bible explicitly condemns favoritism. Favoritism is the willful neglecting of the needs of others in order to privilege the needs of a few. The Apostle Peter writes in Acts 10.34, I now realize that it is true that God does not show favoritism. Elevating the needs of a select few over the needs of others is against the Bible. It's against what God calls us to. And yet, we do know that God gives us favor, right? Over 158 times in the Bible, we hear about God's favor being extended to all people, all while favoritism is explicitly condemned. You see, favoritism is the mechanism that gives birth to social ills like racism, sexism, and homophobia. It's the belief that one group deserves special blessings to the exclusion of everyone else. And at the heart of favoritism is the idea that some people are better inherently than others. And whether or not we're conscious of this thinking or not, in our collective subconscious, it all seems like we all have a bent towards favoritism sometimes, doesn't it? We don't want to admit it often, but we often have this inkling to favor some kind of people over another. We walk with an air of superiority, ready to blame and judge others without first thinking about how we're all in the same boat. We think of others as less worthy than us of love or grace. Favoritism is inherently infused with hubris, the belief that we're better than other kinds of people. And it's also inherently opposed to the spirit of God. Because the Bible says in God's eyes, all of humanity is inherently equal. There's no favorites with God. There are no people who experience more or less of the love of God. God's love is equal for all of us. No matter how good or how evil, how right or how wrong, it's always expanding and growing. It's never lessened or imbalanced. And this truth has historically driven us humans crazy. Because we really believe that God should love us more than he should love our others. We can't see how God could love those bad people who did those bad things over there the same way God loves us. But at the root of it, it's actually an inherent belief that we don't believe that we're deserving of God's love. Because we've done something wrong. We believe that if we're not worthy, No one is worthy. 
We believe that God's love is dependent on things that we do. And yet we know we don't do the right thing often, right? But that's a false gospel. The truth is, the New Testament says none of us has done anything to deserve God's love. In fact, we've all done many things from a human perspective that should separate us from God's love and approval. And yet, in all of our fallenness and failures, God's love remains constant to each and every one of us. Because God by nature is love and will not ever turn his face from anyone that God has created. Love is who God is. And it's the state that we all live in, whether we believe it or not. Nothing you can do can separate you from the love of God. Nothing can force God to distance God's self from us. And that's good news. That's the good news that Jesus came on earth to teach. And the challenge that Jesus gave to us is this. Now that we know this truth, that we are to imitate that same love that's extended to us, to everyone else. We're supposed to work towards loving everyone equally and absolutely. We're to extend grace, a word that's synonymous with that word favor we were talking about earlier, to everyone. In the Bible, grace literally means the positive extension of blessing, regardless of whether a person is deserving or not. This is what God has extended to us, and it's what we're called to extend to everyone. Because God's love is a grace-fueled love, church. And because it's a grace-fueled love, you can begin to see why favoritism is so condemned in Scripture while God's favor is lauded. See, favoritism subverts grace. Favoritism says that there are people who are not worthy of God's blessing or ours. And that's fundamentally opposed to the entire gospel message. The gospel says none of us are worthy of God's love. And yet, God extends immovable and constant blessing of love and grace and favor to each of us. How dare we turn around and refuse that same grace to others? What an affront to God that would be. Jesus taught in Luke 12, 48, to whom much is given, much will be required. We've been given eternal grace, favor, and love, even though from a human vantage point, we don't deserve it. And the only proper response to receiving that grace is to extend it to others. The only proper response is to share that grace that we have been filled with. Which brings us back to racism. Racism can be defined as favoritism towards one's own color, class, or culture. It's the belief in the superiority of one color, class, or culture and the inferiority of others. In the United States, from the conception of this nation, we have believed a lie that Europeans are somehow the superior race, specifically wealthy white Europeans, and that we have a divine mandate from God, those wealthy white Europeans, to conquer the world. We believe that we deserved it because of our color, class, and culture. This insidious lie Sounds ridiculous when it's spoken out loud, doesn't it? Yet, somehow, this is what has built the foundation of the country we live in. We've believed that God, the creator of everyone, chose one group of people based on their color, class, or culture above others. It's illogical and irrational. And yet, it's infected us all. Favoritism towards our own kind has become the MO for so many people. And it is a grave sin. It's an offense to the God who created all of us equally valuable and dignified and worthy of God's love. Nothing could be more anti-Christ than racism or any of the isms 
that represent an extension of favor or worth to one kind of people over others. And did you know that the Bible speaks really specifically to racism? And it also shows us the path out of it as followers of Christ. Over the next three weeks, we're going to camp in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And if you have a Bible, I want to encourage you to be reading this over the next couple of weeks. Because as we read and reflect on it, I believe God will speak to us individually and as a church. But today I want to begin with verses 12 through 14. This is what Paul writes. Just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all of its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit to form this one body. Whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, we were all given one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is made up of not one part, but many. In this passage, Paul is speaking specifically to the church, emphasizing our unity in the Holy Spirit. He says that every person who's part of the body of Christ is fundamentally united and equal. But notice that he specifically names color, culture, and class. He says whether Jew or Gentile, which is color and culture. He says whether slave or free, which is class. He says, in God's eyes, regardless of your color or your class or your culture, you are essentially one. He says that while we're diverse, while we hold various identities, and notice he doesn't minimize the identities, they're important parts of who we are, but he says in the midst of that diversity, we are essentially one. We're equal. We receive the same grace from our creator. We receive the same love from Christ. Regardless of our color, our culture, or our class, we're given access to the same one spirit of God and share a unity in that spirit. And if we believe that true, that's true for us, then racism literally makes no sense in the church of Christ. Economic bias literally makes no sense. Classism literally makes no sense. Because God has declared that all of us in all of our diversity have equal access to God's spirit and equal standing in the family of God. And on the same note, you might wonder about this series title, Gracism. The idea is this. What happens when you put God a big G, in front of racism, you get gracism. This new perspective where we're called to extend God's grace, positive favor to everyone equally, sometimes not in spite of, but because of their color, class, and culture. Gracism is about extending positive favor to people because they're made in the image of God. It's the concept that Paul is really getting at in the scripture. It doesn't matter who you are or where you're from or who you love or what you've done or what you believe. We're all invited to drink from one cup together, to partake in one loaf together, to be connected in one spirit. We're called to extend that same love and that same favor to each other Even those who might make us uncomfortable, who we might not understand, or maybe even those who have done us wrong. Because the call of Christ for each of us, gradually, day by day, is to begin to think and act like God. The God who extends grace and favor to us regardless of all of the various identities and things we've done and where we're from. Or as Dr. Anderson likes to say, God is the biggest gracist of us all. Over the next three weeks, we're going to walk through 1 Corinthians 12 and explore eight particular ways that God outlines through the Apostle Paul how we can use these concepts of gracism to combat racism and favoritism wherever it shows up. But today, I want to leave us with a two-part challenge. First, I want to invite you this week to look inward at yourself, about what we believe. 
Do we believe that we are worthy of God's love and favor? And do we believe that we should deserve God's love or favor more than another kind of person? This is one of the most important truths that if you begin to believe it, I believe will truly change the way you live. Because when you believe you're loved and you're blessed by God, that confidence and that security allows you to be freed up to love and bless others. When we don't believe that we are worthy of God's love and God's blessing, we'll often begin to act in ways that align with favoritism rather than gracism. We begin to believe that we're superior to others, even though deep down we actually don't believe we deserve God's love at all. And we treat others with disrespect and honor, or disrespect and dishonor. How many of us know that most of our insecurities cause us to act in horrible, terrible ways towards others? It's because of this lack of belief that God extends his love to us that we refuse to extend love to others. We know the people in our own life who have the hardest time embodying God's love for us are often the people that need to be told that they are loved and accepted the most. The truth is that the people who are jerks to us at work are jerks because deep down they have a wound. They have an inner emptiness. They're not feeling loved or lovable. And our most destructive attitudes come from this behavior rooted in a wound. This wound that says we are not loved, maybe because our parents didn't love us or our friends didn't love us the way that we believed we should be loved. That we have forgotten the fundamental truth that God, the very source of love, has declared we are loved and that nothing can ever separate us from that. If this week, as you reflect on this question of whether or not you believe that you are loved by God, and you come up realizing that perhaps that's a hard thing for you to believe, I want to encourage you to take one of the cards, the brown card in particular, that's on the seats around you. And on those words are printed Paul's words from Romans 8.28, which says, nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ. And as cheesy as it might sound, if you struggle to believe you're loved, I want to challenge you this week to take that card and tape it on your mirror or someplace where you get ready in the morning and just take 60 seconds to say those words, to speak them over yourself and your life as you look at yourself in the mirror. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. See, I believe we can't begin to confront our racism and favoritism until we confront our own self-hatred, our own discrimination and feeling that we believe that we're not worthy of love or acceptance of God or of other people. And if we speak the truth of God's word over our life, the scripture promises us that God's word doesn't return void, that we will begin to be shaped by the power of that promise and that truth. Nothing can separate you from God's love. The more you speak it, the more you'll believe it, and the more you'll begin to live it. And the second challenge I want to give to us is one that's really uncomfortable if you actually do it, and I really encourage you to do it. To take a few moments at some point this week and analyze your bias towards favoritism in your own life. What biases do you have? Do you have seeds of racism still within you? How about Islamophobia or misogyny or any form of xenophobia, which just means fear of people who have different identities and experiences than you? Take time and be honest with yourself. Take time to name the favoritisms in your own life. Because if you can't name it, you'll never be able to address it. If you can't name it, you can't do what Hussein said at the beginning of the sermon, which is to dig out the root and burn it up. God is calling us as a church, as a people, especially in this moment of our world's history, to get honest and real, 
To not deny, like my own story, that I grew up in an environment infused with racism. And that it takes a long time to get all of that out of your internal wiring. And most of us in this room grew up in environments where our parents or our friends or our families told us and taught us to have biases against certain kinds of people. But all of those biases are fundamentally an affront to God's creative design. And God is calling us now. God is giving us the opportunity now to name it, to own it, and to work to change it. This is a gift from God to us in this season. And what would happen if people around you began to see a tangible change in the way you address your isms? Maybe you might inspire your coworkers, your family, your friends to begin to confront the biases, prejudices, the racism that they might have in their own heart. And we'll begin a movement of racism that can begin to transform our world. So I want you to take this challenge seriously. To speak the words of God's truth over you this week. That nothing can separate you from God's love because you are worthy of love. And to find the ways in your own life that you continue to perpetuate division. Because God is calling us in this season away from favoritism and into the posture of being radical, Christ-centered gracists. These challenges this week are not easy. The path towards rooting out racism and sexism and homophobia and any other ism is not fun. But if we want to become the people who God created us to be, the people who reflect God's heart, then this is the path we must walk together. So mission gathering, are you ready to become a community of gracists? Can I hear something louder than that? Are you ready to become a community of gracists? Amen. Just be very careful if you talk about this with your friends to really emphasize that G in the front so they hear that we're a community of gracists. That's what we're going for. Will you pray with me? Dear Lord, you are the divine creator who has made each one of us with complex identities, with diversity that reflects your creativity. And God, today we come and we confess that so often we have chosen to be people who extend favoritism to others based on these identities that you've created. We confess that we are people who often choose to prejudice ourselves against certain kinds of people. God, today we repent collectively of our sin of racism as a church, as a country, and as individuals. Today we repent of our sin of extending favoritism to one group of people over another. God, we pray that your spirit would move in us in this moment to convict our hearts, to show us where we still extend prejudice and bias. Holy Spirit, would your light shine on that and move us to name it, to own it, and to begin to root it out of our lives. For your word says, God, that we are all one in you. We are all one in our diversity. God, as we move into the series over the next three weeks, would you move in the heart of Mission Gathering, both as a body collectively and as individuals, to become people who embody your call to gracism in the world? Would we be obedient to hear your spirit speak to us? And would you transform us so that we might be a witness to those in each of our sphere of influence and to the community around us? So God, we ask this, expecting you to do all that we've requested. In Jesus' holy name, amen.